Growing up in a Boston suburb during the 80s was rough. I came up in a neighborhood that was rife with shady activity. It was the kind of place that changed when the sun went down sketchy streets and arterial alleyways that looked sinister when shrouded in darkness. My dad was an introverted workaholic and the subsequent loneliness driving my mom to the bottle. I was rebellious, angry, and without income. It was the perfect storm. Naturally, I fell into petty crime. School was a joke, a glorified daycare for hopeless kids with no future in anything but prison or the morgue. We were extremely disrespectful to the faculty. On more than one occasion, a member of the teaching staff was assaulted by a student. But there was one teacher who seemed to be an exception. He was someone who the kids never talked back to someone who had that natural air of authority about him. His name was Mr. Metzger. A few teachers at our school were a mess. Fresh college graduates who were only maybe a year older than the kids in our class. A couple of functioning alcoholics who smelled like vodka at 830 each morning. Shirt buttons undone with loose tacky Walmart ties, complete with five-day stubble. But not Mr. Metzger he was always clean-shaven, his thinning gray hair combed over a bald patch on the crown of his head. He commanded respect. On Friday evening, my buddies and I were smoking cigarettes, cruising in a battered old Ford when the subject of Mr. Metzger came up. You know he's a war veteran, right? Dude was Marine or some crap, got a silver star for killing like 10 enemy soldiers in the ambush or something once said, I call BS the other retorted. Not everyone who served was some stone cold killer. My uncle was in the army motor pool said he never fired a shot. Nah, man maskers hardcore. He broke a kid's jaw breaking up a fight a few years back. That kid's job was already broken. And if Mr. Metzger was in the Marines, he certainly never talked about it. Later that night, we pulled up to a small stucco house on the outskirts of Jamaica Plain. It was pretty unassuming. Not the usual middle-class housing. We targeted for burglaries, but my buddy in the back seat insisted he should this is the right place. Dude for the last time yes. The guy buys and sells auto parts is always a buttload of cash stashed inside. I'm telling you, this will be a huge score for us. We parked around the block, scanning the area, before we approached the house, pulling out bandanas and balaclavas. We used them to obscure faces from any potential witnesses. It was quiet out almost pitch black if it wasn't for the dim fluorescent glow of orange street lamps. Breaking into the garage was easy. The rotting wood of a side door gave way from around the old rusty lock. And just like that, we were inside. The interior of the damp dark garage held no car parts, no sign of any mechanical work at all. I shot our insistent friend a scornful look. We should have just left right then and there. But we were young, foolish and arrogant. We didn't want to walk away empty-handed. At the door to the main house. We listened for any sign of activity inside and it was silent. Gall took hold of the door handle and pulled a short corridor lead to a side room which was evidently serving as a kind of office space. With books and paperwork piled on an old desk. I crept inside while my buddy searched the rest of the ground floor for valuables. It was searched in the office that I began to notice a few things about the person who lived here. Despite being time-worn and dilapidated, the room was incredibly orderly and neat. The contents of shelves were immaculately arranged with one wall, displaying a ragged-looking flag, red and blue, with a yellow star in the center. I had no idea what country it was from, but I did get a feeling I'd seen it before somewhere. A section of wall was decorated with framed newspaper clippings. They were almost impossible to read in the darkness, but a shaft of pale moonlight creeping in through a grimy window drew my eye to one word in particular, Vietnam. Our late-night burglaries were hallways heart-pounding affairs, but an unfamiliar terror began to claw my guts as I quietly slid open one of the desk drawers there sat next to the dull metal of a Colt 45 with some kind of necklace, bumpy his wrinkled shapes, haphazardly strung together with a piece of cord. 
I squinted in the darkness, reaching inside to run the fingertip along one of the furred clumps. They felt textured, desiccated. I had a solid lump of fear in my throat. The hairs in the back of my neck standing on end by the time I realized what they were. There were human ears. I started to back out of the room, feeling the raw palms, sweating, tears coursing through me as my mind began to race. We need to get out of here. We need to get out of here right now. I could hear the creak of old floorboards growing closer to me. By the time I saw something rushed past the window. I stopped peering into the street outside in time to see another shape, hurtling past the grubby pane of glass at full sprint. It was my buddies. I was alone, alone with whoever was creeping up on me in the corridor behind. I turned in time to see him standing in the threshold blocking my escape. I'll never forget the sound of the rhythmic inhale and exhale of air through his nostrils. The breath sounded ragged, almost shaky, relaying the absolute fury and contempt that the figure felt for me. He stepped forward, his face momentarily bathed in the dim moonlight, features that were twisted by wrath, pale blue eyes that seethed with a predatory glare. It was Mr. Metzger. He launched. I was fast, but he was faster, stronger, and possibly so. We struggled, grunting and growling as his rough callous hands tried to wrap themselves around my neck. It was a practiced maneuver. It seemed instinctual to him. To my absolute horror, the black bandana that disguised me began to loosen slipping down a little as we fought. If he sees my face on death, blind panic set in. I threw myself forward my forehead smashing into one of his eye sockets. His grip loosened, I thrashed and kicked as he cried out in pain, freeing myself just enough to be able to pull myself away from him and make a dash for the garage. I burst out of the house, tearing down the street as fast as my legs could carry me in a second now, and a second now he's going to aim that Colt 45 and blow my head off. I couldn't bring myself to look back. I didn't want to see him fire the shot that would end me. Dude was a Marine, killed 10 people. I'm going to be the 11th, God helped me, I'm going to be the 11th the shot never came. Somehow I managed to reach the end of the street, ducking into one of the garbage-strewn alleys that meander through the neighborhood like rat runs, almost punched my cowardly friends when I finally caught up with them. They left me alone with that maniac. Left me alone to die. Are you kidding me? You saw was inside the house. We got out at the moment. We saw what was in there, once said attempting to defend himself. He could have warned me man, you just up and left me there alone. Thing in the TV room. It was made of hair, human hair. My other buddy finally spoke up his cigarette burned until the hanging ash seemed to defy gravity. Shut up. That was not human hair. We don't know what it was. Then tell him about the other thing dude. Go ahead tell him. My other buddy sounded almost distraught at this point. I don't want to talk about that. It almost sounded childlike. His cynicism and bravado stripped away. They never did talk about what they saw. The botched burglary was never mentioned again. I dropped out of high school shortly after following my buddies deeper into a life of criminality until an arrest for grand theft got me six months in prison. After my release, I turned my life around. I got a job, earned my GD, and attended a local community college to study home improvement. I lead a quiet life now. I'm a father and a husband. I eat my wife's cooking. I watch the Red Sox. I go to bed at 11 a.m. a different person now. But just last week in the Home Depot over near Southey. I thought I recognized an elderly man shuffling among the aisles. I followed curiously, for a minute or two keeping my distance until the man turned and locked eyes with me. I know you he said on smiling. You're one of my old high school students. Yet, JB, high class 86. Utah history right. I felt that old familiar dread permeating my guts. That's right. He said his cold blue eyes studying me intently. You look like you landed on your feet. Not bad for a dropout. 
Yeah, I got myself together in the end. Teenagers, right? I forced a weak smile. Right, a solemn look on his face as his tone dropped a little. Everyone deserves a second chance. Even if they did bad things in their youth, and there was a weight behind his words. My palms grew damp against the plastic push bar the cart. Well, nice seeing you again, Mr. Metzger. I'm kind of amazed even recognize me. I said beginning to wheel my cart away trying to hide my anxiety. Oh, he replied, an almost wolfish grin on his withered old face as I saw the same predatory glare in his eyes than I did 30 years ago. I never forget a face. The education system here in the UK is a little different than the US. You see, we don't have a middle school. We don't have that kind of social buffer that separates children from young adults. So when you're 11 years old, you're suddenly dropped into a campus that includes larger, intimidating teenagers. As bad as it sounds, leaving the nurturing environment of primary school and entering the unforgiving hormone-saturated world of secondary school is daunting to say the least. Granted, I was quite a shy child, but seeing all these spotty-faced, deep-voiced airy miscreants dragging their knuckles to the corridors. It was terrifying. They were like monsters. I didn't understand the things they did, nor the things they said. I remember just trying to keep my head down. Try not to get noticed by any potential bullies. And so that's where the story begins. With myself as a frightened, quiet boy in a place that made me dread having to wake up in the morning, homework being popular, avoiding trouble. I thought that was as bad as it was going to get for me. I was wrong. The headmaster of the school was named Dr. Sylvester. He wasn't a medical doctor. He had earned the title in some lesser field, but he went by doctor nonetheless, he struck me as a cold man. His welcoming speech to the year sevens made secondary school seem like an ordeal we had to endure, then an experience that would enrich us. The speech was emotionless with subordinate teachers learning the old school hall, like prison camp guards. The man was somewhat of a mystery to me. But then everything at the tender age of eleven is mystery. Every little aspect of life threatens and frightens. I remember feeling an immense pressure at the time, pressure to succeed, pressure to conform. I was told not to question things that adults always had our best interests at heart. If only that were true. I recall it being a brisk autumn morning. Leafless skeletal trees and piles of rotting leaf litter lined the pavements. We had French class at first period, by far the most loathe of the subjects I took, not because I disliked the language, and I was actually pretty good at it. The problem was the woman who taught the class at the time I had the notion that she simply disliked me, that I had offended her in some way that it was in my interest to correct but in retrospect, it was clear she hated her job. The dreadful scenario of having broken free from an institution like school only to find herself right back in one trapped. I understand why she was so contemptuous. Maybe she had a dream once something she longed for, only to find that it was late, that she was too busy. Just another one of life's little tragedies. During the middle of the period, as I watched the hands of the classroom clock moving painfully slowly, the dull silence of the room was interrupted by a shrill, piercing sound. It was the fire bell. Some of the children jumped nervously whispering to each other as they awaited the instruction of the teacher. Fire drill. The French teacher's voice was a flat drone, everybody lined up outside the building. There was a touch of excitement in the air. By then, the fire drill broke up the monotony of the long, boring school day, we gathered our belongings, filing out of the classroom as the teacher to the monotone murmur of single file. As you can imagine, other classes were also doing the same. So before long, there was quite a number of children all walking down one long locker line corridor. I had been in fire drills before, obviously. So I was no stranger to the actual drill. But there was something different about this one, something which wafted through the corridors, towards, and washed over the already nervous children. We could smell smoke, something was actually burning. The most terrifying memory of the event wasn't the fire itself. 
It wasn't the ominous smell of burning plastic or the cries of frightened students who were beginning to panic. It was the look on the presiding teachers' faces when they realized the very real danger we were in. At that age, adults seemed invincible. Like they can solve every problem and then some. I had never in my short life seen a look of terror so pure on a grown-up's face. It shook me to the bone. With anxious voices, the teachers herded us to the nearest exit. The intensity of the smoke increases as we moved. Pouring out of the building, we could see the far wing of the school building as it burned. Wildfires dancing among thick black smoke, then the screams began. Children turn in the direction the building's burning section, pointing and screeching as a figure emerged from the conflagration who was engulfed in flame, a walking inferno whose cries of pains were burned up before they can leave charred lips. Then there were sirens, flashing blue lights, and men that wore fluorescent uniforms. Paramedics tried to stifle the blaze on the burning man. The sight of his charged smoking corpse had children in tears as teachers barked at them to look away. Looking away didn't help. Even when I closed my eyes and put my fingers in my ears, I could still smell it, I could still smell the burning flesh. The school actually closed down for a week while the damage could be assessed. Local authorities offered to pay for trauma counseling for the entire teaching staff and student body. Our class along with our respective parents attended a group session at a nearby community center. I didn't understand any of it. I didn't understand why we would want to all sit around and talk about something so terrible. Why we all weren't just at home trying to be happy trying to forget. It's terrible to say so. But I considered the time off as a sort of special holiday. I was allowed to play video games for as long as I wanted. My parents even bought me a new game. I could tell they thought I was upset that they were trying to be good parents. I just didn't question any of it. Like I said, I just thought it was better to try to forget. Why would I want to remember the sight of that burning man climbing from the debris? Why would anyone want to remember that? After a few days, the school sent a letter out to all the families involved. The cause of the fire was said to be an electrical fault. A freak surge that shorted a kitchen power outlets and set fire to a broken refrigerator. However, I didn't notice something about my parents around that time. When I was out of the room, I would hear them talking in hushed tones. They were discussing something they didn't want me to hear something secret. I was a curious kid. Sure. But I had no desire to eavesdrop. I was acutely aware that there were things in the world I really didn't want to know about. Some things are better left to secrets. It took 10 years for the truth to come out. One evening, whilst sitting down for a home-cooked family meal, we started to discuss my school days. It was nothing in particular at first, but somehow the subject for the fire came up. Just a passing comment. Nothing shocking or abrasive. It my parents reacted rather strangely. My dad put down his cutlery and cleared his throat, giving my mom a long serious look. She did the same sign before she turned to me and spoke. Alex, you remember that fire at your school? Right? I nodded. Of course I did. The school held a service for the burn janitor when he passed over from his injuries. Well, we didn't tell you the truth back then about the fire. We're sorry. We hope you understand that we did what we thought was best at the time. I stayed silent. My eyes darting between my parents simply waiting for whatever it was they had to say. The thing is son, my dad took over, taking my mom's hand in his and giving it a loving squeeze. That fire was no accident. Someone set fire to the school. Tried to burn it down. With all the children inside. Mom interjected she brought her hand to her mouth and her voice began to crack fresh tears twinkling in the corner of her eyes. My dad just hushed her comforting her softly before he continued. You see Mr. Sylvester, the head teacher. That wasn't his name at all. Before then. He never held the teaching position in his life. His name was Bernard Lee. Bernard Lee began an affair with a woman then wanted to escape his family. 
He wanted a new life, he wanted a clean slate. So one night, while his wife and children were sleeping, he doused their home in petrol and set it ablaze. My mom was sobbing at this point, tears rolling down her cheeks, which he still managed a few final words. But unlike you, son, who was so lucky to have, those children never escaped. They never escaped. We all broke down at this point embracing as a family, counting our blessings that my class was able to escape from a similar fate as those poor, unwanted children of Bernard Lee. Later on in life, shortly before I actually decided to commit this piece of memory to paper, I thought back to that time in my life when I was young and frightened when everything was so big and scary, when the vast possibility of life terrified, instead of inspired when I thought I was walking among monsters. How could I have possibly known back then? That I was right.